Welcome back to Open Line. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We have been talking about the situation at Fort Negley and really just the big picture problem of homelessness across Nashville. What are the solutions and how close are we to getting there? I hope that you have learned just like I have throughout this um, past hour, past 40 minutes, just what a dire situation this is and, and what a big situation this is. About six months ago when I came to TV5, um, not long after, we did a story on the tiny homes. Mm -hmm. And you, you turn on HGTV and it's like the new cool thing to live in a tiny home. But this has been a solution to homelessness. Tell me what's happening with that. Right. So um, locally, Green Street Church has about eight tiny homes right now. And um, a pastor named Jeff Carr helped donate a lot of those units. And homecoming groups at like middle schools donated a couple others. Oh, very cool. So. Um, yeah, so people are moving from tents to tiny homes, and there's dignity in that. Mm -hmm. You can actually lock the door wow. and have some semblance of safety. Um, now, the tiny homes cost a little bit more than the tents, of course, um, depending on how you do it. But um, either tiny homes or tents give people a semblance of privacy sure. and dignity. Mm -hmm. So, it's a um, place of their own. It's a place of their own. That's all and, what we want. And people like how the tiny homes look a little bit yeah. more than tents most often. So <laughs> that's fun. Is, is this a, 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 can it be a bigger solution than just this one little place? Do you it, think? I mean, is it I realistic? I think it could. I think it could. Mm -hmm. um, we, we know that transitional housing doesn't end homelessness. So we're cautious about saying mm -hmm. tiny homes are the solution. But um, they are absolutely a part of the solution. And permanent tiny homes could also be part of that solution too. Right. I, I mean in the most cases the tiny homes would not be places people would want to spend their lives but as bridge housing for people that are still searching for homes they're certainly much better than just a tent. They're, w they're on that waiting list to get right. a voucher. Mm -hmm. They're on their, right. or they have the voucher and they're trying to find a place that right. will accept them. And we're hoping that other church communities or other churches will join Green Street in offering to host uh, a settlement of tiny homes. And we were talking about one of the solutions is um, the land that the you, were, land. you were referencing earlier. And I was saying, do you, are you talking to church? And you say, we are, but they don't have the land. So we're, you're trying to right. go through different avenues. What's important, if, if a pastor's out there or a church member's out there and they say, well, we have land. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's in the right spot. Right. What, what, what do you need? We need land that's close to public transportation. So it doesn't have to be in the urban downtown corridor. It can be out on, as long as there's some kind of access or some kind of van transportation system to um, public mm -hmm. transit. That's one of the most important things. Um, it's helpful that they're not in a super concentrated residential area, right? Yeah, because um, everyone's going to start squawking. Right. right. Yeah, you understand but that. if we could identify a few churches that have some land, um, even parking lots, and if we could identify some other churches who want to come on board and help those churches, or even lease city land or private land, because if a religious group leases the land, there's more, they have more flexibility with codes. Mm -hmm. So this is, we're really hoping that people will come forward. They can contact us at Open Table. We'd love to talk to them. We can have a conversation with Green Street and pull it all together and answer some of those frequent questions, sure. right? Some of those concerns. Yeah. Um, we know what works and what doesn't work, and we're developing a kind of toolkit for people that want to start this. So there are resources there and you won't be alone. I have to say, I, our, our time is winding down a bit, and I just am intrigued by both of you all and your hearts and your spirits. You have very sweet spirits, and obviously, you just know this issue, and you delve into it every single day, and it's mm -hmm. not a job, it's a passion, right. and it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a life that you've chosen mm -hmm. um, that not a lot of people do. It's tough work. Mm -hmm. Why? Why do you all do it? Well, how did you come to this, and why do you do it? Uh, I first got involved. I was uh, teaching high school at Montgomery Bell Academy. I'd done it wow. for 13 years. Mm -hmm. So I saw one cycle that some people don't see, the cycle of wealth. Sure. And many of us that grow up middle class don't see that. We're caught in it, but um, there are many things that give us advantages that we don't recognize. Parents that are there mm -hmm. for us at various times, parents that didn't abuse us as children. Sometimes, of course, all walks of sure. life find that. But there's some sort of safety net for people in that situation. Then the cycle of poverty, mm -hmm. which I discovered not long after Jimmy Fulmer died, froze to death on the streets of a church mm -hmm. in East Nashville, not far from where I was living. Mm -hmm. And um, I was shocked that in a city like Nashville, we had people freezing to death on the streets. And so mm -hmm. I started becoming involved. One of the first people that I worked with could have been my mother. She was, uh, she had fairly severe anxiety and had lost her job because of that. And she was living out of her car, had been for about a year. And then she lost her car because she couldn't keep up with the payments. 
And you know, it, when you see that kind of tragedy firsthand, uh, it it shocks you in a way that it's hard to believe that this is happening. Mm -hmm. um, people are suffering on the streets uh, every day and the trauma of just being on the streets is substantial. Mm -hmm. And when you see that, it's hard not to to realize in your heart that there's something that you, poss you must be able to do something to change it. And we mm -hmm. can, it's not impossible, but you have to reach out, you have to break th through the barrier of fear that many people have. And once you do that, you realize these are human beings that have suffered so much for years, and but that whose lives uh, can change if you help them empower themselves. Mm -hmm. Housing uh, is housing first is the approach that we take in Nashville through House Nashville. It's not only helps in the suffering; that is to say, get people into housing first before asking them to do anything else mm -hmm. to change their lives. It enables them. <coughs> to begin recreating their lives. And that's the best thing. Mm -hmm. It also saves money. It, mm -hmm. It's been uh, stated over and over, about $14,000 to help somebody into permanent supportive housing versus over $35,000 a year when they're out on the street, including in Nashville, according to a study, about three million a year to criminalize them for the policing mm -hmm. efforts that goes on. A huge waste of money that makes the problem worse. And it, it yeah. really just, you have to switch your mind because yeah. right. right. those numbers just don't make sense when you first think about them. Like, they don't. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. I get it. But just think yeah. that you get that first house, I mean, you guys know this, but I'm just thinking, what a stress comes off you when you mm -hmm. can have some place to call home. Right. Yeah. I love your story. Lindsay, tell me your story. Um, I had poverty and suffering, addiction and mental health issues in my extended family. So um, some of my relatives were in and out of jail, on and off the streets. So I did see that, but I didn't realize how dire the situation was both globally and um, nationally here until I came to college and started seeing the statistics like Samuel was saying. Um, and I was really concerned about the statistics and then I started seeing the faces on the statistics. Mm -hmm. um, the people I started seeing in our own backyard became my friends and my mentors. And that kind of plunged me into this world and this work. But what kept me going is the incredible resilience. Um, there's mm -hmm. incredible suffering, but there's incredible resilience and incredible hope and agency. Um, I've seen more hospitality from people on the streets mm -hmm. than I see in a lot of our churches and a lot of our city. Um, just over the last couple of days, I've received uh, so many calls from people in other campsites and the low-income housing that we've gotten them into. They have nothing, but they've called me and they've said, saw what's happening with Fort Negley, I heard about it. If they need somewhere to go, you call me. You move them into my camp, I'll make space. Mm -hmm. There was one guy who called me and said, I have a, an apartment, um, it's really a mess right now, but I'm sick, I have to sleep sitting up so they can have my bed. Wow. These are mm -hmm. the kind of things that keep us going. Mm -hmm. And that is humbling, and it's energizing, and it's beautiful, so. It's beautiful work what you guys are doing, and I know it is not easy, and it's I know not. it has to be very discouraging on a day-to-day -day basis. It is. So, thank you for yeah. what you guys are doing because a lot of people obviously choose not to do it mm -hmm. and don't even want to see it. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to wrap everything up. Stay right where you are.